Hi, this is Steve with Thresher Media Group. Welcome to When You're Ready to Listen. This podcast is dedicated to exploring the truth about God, things you may not have understood, may not have been taught, or quite frankly, had a very hard time believing. And since our entire relationship with God rests on believing, it is important we learn how to separate the truth from the many lies and fictions that abound within the religion of Christianity. So when you're ready to listen, tune in and discover a pathway to freedom, encouragement, life, and hope. Episode 103, Revelation 12, verses 14 through 16. In our last podcast, we began discussing the third woe, the time when the dragon and his army are unleashed upon humanity. They are filled with fury over having lost the word of Michael and his angels. The devil's reaction to having been thrown to the earth was to persecute the woman, Israel. This is something which he has done for centuries. Then we discussed the two wings of the great eagle upon which the woman will fly for protection from the presence of or from the face of the serpent. We speculated for many reasons that the eagle might just be a reference to the United States of America, with the two wings addressing both the political will and the military will of the United States both of which come to significance in helping the woman fly to safety. The woman flies, Revelation 12, 14. And two wings of the great eagle were caused to be given to the woman so that she might now choose to fly into the wilderness to her place where she is now caused to be nourished or fattened for a time and times and half a time from the presence, literally the face of the serpent. So that she might now choose to fly into the wilderness to her place. Previously in Revelation 12, 6, the woman fled to the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days. These were figurative days, and this wilderness was understood to be the nations where God kept her safe until the time that she could be brought back to the land, which did not occur until 1948. And here, once again, the woman might flee to the wilderness, to the nations, However, this time we are specifically told that she is equipped by the two wings of the eagle so that she might now choose to fly, not flee, but fly into the wilderness to her place. She is enabled and equipped, but since fly is rendered as a subjunctive, as a possibility, she still must choose. But if she does, the fact that she will fly indicates her escape will be sudden and swift. However, it should be noted that not all Israel will fly off to the wilderness, for two-thirds of the population is doomed to destruction. It will come about in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts of it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. One-third of Israel will be preserved by God. This one-third, these are the elect, the righteous from among the Jews. He will say, this third I will bring through the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, Yahweh is my God. And the elect will know when it's time to flee. Jesus already warned them. Matthew 24, 15 through 28. So when you see the abomination of desolation, having been caused to be spoken of by the prophet Daniel, having been caused to standing in the holy place, who is now reading is now commanded to understand. Then those who are in Judea are commanded to now flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are now being pregnant and for those who are now nursing infants in those days, you are commanded to now choose to pray that your flight may not choose to be in winter or on a Sabbath, For then there will choose to be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will choose to be. And if those days had not been cut short, no one would be caused to be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will be caused to arise and will show great signs and wonders 
so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is now in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning now chooses to come from the east and now is, to, is caused to flash even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man choose to be. Wherever the corpse now is, there the eagles will be caused to gather. This is one of those passages that has many layers, which are possibly applicable to differing time periods. There are many who teach that this passage addresses the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by the Romans. And while it is likely to have been applicable to that time, as many people relied on this passage to flee from the Roman destruction, we can be confident that this is primarily a passage regarding the end times and not simply the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Jesus states that there will be a great tribulation that won't come about until after the abomination of desolation. And it'll be so great that there'll be nothing like it ever before occurring, nor ever again. It will be the great tribulation that ensues after the blowing of the seventh trumpet. The destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, it was bad for sure. But it was not unlike the destruction that was carried out by Babylon many centuries prior. To obtain the rank of such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will choose to be, it would have to be far worse than the worst we have ever seen. It'd be hard to argue that this event was worse than what happened in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, much less all of World War II, where it is estimated that between 70 million to 118 million, 357,000 people died. And then there were the purgings in the Soviet Union after World War II, where it is estimated that Stalin alone slaughtered over 20 million of their own people due to racial and political dissent. And then there's Mao Zedong, whose government is responsible for the killing of between 40 to 80 million of its own people. The point is that there has been a lot of bad. So for something to rank of such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no one never will choose to be, it is likely not the invasion of Jerusalem by the Romans. In addition, during that time of Roman destruction, false Christs were not arising with great signs and wonders to mislead the many even if possible, the elect. So, although this may be a layered text with some applicability to the destruction by Rome, where many people did flee to the wilderness for safety, this is first and foremost an advance warning of a terrible day yet to come. The prophet Daniel stated that 30 days before the end of the first three and a half year period of the tribulation, the man of sin, the son of destruction, literally the son of Apollyon, will be revealed. Other than the references to the Assyrian, which we have discussed, this is one of the only times that the Codex refers to the man we call the Antichrist, the man who will be possessed by the beast. Most references in the Codex are to the angelic spirit, the beast, who himself is the abomination of desolation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 5, the spirit reveals that the beast sits in the sanctuary of God, the nous and is even now exhibiting himself as now being God. He is now choosing to exalt himself above all that is now being caused to be called God, or all that is worshipped. Yet it is happening now. The fact that he sits is very important. In the language of the Codex, this indicates that he is ruling from that location. It is essentially where his throne of authority has been placed. This contrasts with when someone is depicted as standing, which indicates that they are now ready to act. But what is entirely shocking is that his throne, so to speak, is in the holy place, the sanctuary where the priests minister. In other words, he operates in and amongst the priesthood of God, right there along with the two witnesses. And he is even now exhibiting himself as now being God. He is now choosing to exalt himself above all that is now being caused to be called God or all that is worshipped. He is the abomination of desolation. The beast has established his authority from within the community of true believers, those priests who are permitted into the sanctuary. This, this reveals much about the cunning and deceit of the beast. He utilizes Christianity to, even now, secure his position of authority 
such that he is found in and amongst the bondservants of God. Now, this should not surprise us as even the servants of Satan clothe themselves in light and transfigure themselves as servants of righteousness. Thus, he'll likely fool many right up to the point that he attempts to kill everyone who will not worship him. In that light, Jesus says, so when you might see the abomination of desolation, having been caused to be spoken of by the prophet Daniel, having been caused to standing in the holy place, who is now reading, is now commanded to understand. Then those who are in Judea are commanded to now flee to the mountains. In other words, Jesus is saying that when you see the beast rising from his base of authority from within the church to act, to go to war, standing against all those who will not worship him as God, then it is most definitely time to flee. Referring to the passage in Zechariah 13, 8 through 9, and the one third of the Jews who will escape destruction, Jesus' instruction is very specific. Those who are in Judea are commanded to now flee to the mountains. He did not say those who are in Israel, but Judea. Thus, when Jesus speaks of those in Judea who will flee, he is not addressing literal Judea, the small territory in southern Israel. Rather, he is speaking in code. Judea is symbolic for the elect, the one-third from among the Jews who are preserved because they refuse to follow the beast into apostasy. This is reminiscent of much of the record in the Old Testament, which separates Judea, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, who worshipped Yahweh from the ten northern territories of Israel, who early on became apostate and worshipped demonic gods. It is interesting to note that Jesus rendered some parts of this passage in the present tense. For instance, the command to now flee to the mountains, referencing those who are now pregnant and now nursing. This is a layered part of the text that on the one hand did serve as a present warning, albeit 40 years later, as to what they should do when the Roman general with his band of Assyrian conscripts came to destroy Jerusalem, as many Jews followed this instruction and fled to the mountains for security. And on the other hand, it speaks of a powerful spiritual truth that we will get to in Revelation 13, which addresses the responsibility of those who now see and now understand what is happening in the midst of the sanctuary. But make no mistake, Jesus was clear. The abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel is here. And when we have eyes to see it, those in Judea will flee to the mountains for there will be a time of great tribulation. Such has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will choose to be. The two witnesses never flee. This warning by Jesus was given to the elect, the righteous from among the Jews who do not and will not worship the beast as God. With that said, this instruction is not for the two witnesses, the called and chosen and faithful bondservants of Jesus Christ, who are even now found to be worshiping in the sanctuary of God. The two witnesses do not flee, for they are sent on a mission to make prophetic declarations and to remove blessings from the earth, to destroy the blessings that exist, and to release calamity and wounds as often as they desire. It's a very specific mission that results in their getting slaughtered in the great city of religious apostasy during the war which the beast wages against them. In effect, they serve as a sacrifice offered up for the elect. This indicates that as bad as the great tribulation, the time of wrath, will be for the elect, it could have been worse. Perhaps it's because of this sacrifice that the days of wrath will be mercifully cut short, as Jesus said, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Again, when the beast rises and is understood to be standing in and amongst the community of the two witnesses, who is now reading, is now commanded to understand, it's time for those in Judea to flee. For next comes war, then the rapture, and then this great tribulation. Her place in the wilderness, so that she might now choose to fly into the wilderness to her place. The Codex mentions a time when the Jews will flee the land of Israel, likely to the nations near to Israel. Yahweh will cause a great split in the Mount of Olives, resulting in the formation of a wide valley 
which will run from east to west. Perhaps this is a result of the great earthquake which shakes the world right after the rapture occurs. The Jews will flee hastily through this valley, which will stretch across to Azal. Now, there is no place that anyone has been able to identify that is called Azal, so hardly anyone thinks that Azel is rendered in this passage as a proper noun, as a specific place. Instead, this word translated in Hebrew is very near. Thus, they will flee through this valley which Yahweh creates to a place prepared for them that is relatively nearby. Many end times junkies believe that Azal is a reference to the ancient city of Petra, which is just over the border in Jordan. It is a rock city that was historically quite impregnable a rock of protection and salvation. If this is where they fly, it is an awesome real-life metaphor for Jesus, who is our rock of protection and our salvation, the place where we are to flee. Petra literally means rock, which is quite appropriate as this city is literally carved from rose-red sandstone hills and cliffs. Petra is a little over 100 miles away from Jerusalem and only a -a two-and-a-half-hour bus ride from the border of Israel. It's not that far away and is a place where the Jews could quickly flee, especially if they were using military equipment provided to them by the Great Eagle. On the approach to Petra, there is this long, narrow shaft, the sides of which are 200 feet high. That is the only entry into the city, a shaft that is easily defensible for long periods of time. Petra used to be occupied by the Nabataeans and had anywhere between 20,000 to 100,000 residents. The area eventually conquered by the Romans, but Petra remained a central trading center for many years. It was eventually abandoned as other more efficient trading routes were established. But Petra was first known as the city of Edom, or the Rose Red City. It was founded by Esau, the brother of Jacob. The city is a labyrinth of thousands of caves and tombs, and it'll be capable of housing and handling the multitude of Jews fleeing the onslaught of the beast. It is believed that the Nabataean king, Harath, also known as Aretes, gave sanctuary to the high priest Jason of Jerusalem when Antiochus IV, who is a biblical type of the Antichrist and whose affairs are described in Daniel 11, removed Jason from office and established his own high priest, Menelaus, from the tribe of Benjamin. So the area has a history of protecting the Jews. In Arab tradition, Petra is the place where Moses struck a rock with his staff and water came forth. And it's also where his sister Miriam is buried. Now, the area has water issues and it sits in the Jordanian desert. But it is said that there is a spring called Musa, which flows into the city. Musa is the Arabic name for Moses. Ironically, if the elect do flee to Petra, they will be watered by the spring of Moses, reminiscent of their being watered in the desert by the rock which Moses struck. Furthermore, God might already be working out the water issue through the Jordanian government. In conjunction with the Petra National Trust, there is a current proposal to restore parts of the ancient Nabataean hydraulic system. The goal would be to protect the site from flash floods, to harvest water for use within the site, and to revive the indigenous vegetation. Now, this whole Petra escape is a speculation, as the Codex does not directly come out and say it, but it does have some intriguing biblical underpinnings. It provides a nearby place in the nations, the wilderness, for the woman to fly. In that vein of thought, in Daniel 11.41, we are also given evidence that Jordan, ancient Edom and Moab, and the chief sons of Amnon, will evade the grasp which the beast has on the nations, which would make Jordan a safe place for which the Jews to flee. Perhaps this is a blessing provided by God, as Jordan is only one of two countries in the Middle East that has a long-standing peace treaty with Israel, the only other one being Egypt. And the Lord promised centuries ago that anyone who would bless Israel would be blessed by God just as anyone who would curse Israel would be cursed by God. In that regard, somehow Jordan is miraculously protected from the clutches of the beast, where it seems that most other nations are submitted to his rule and authority. 
Who knows? But perhaps God is just fulfilling his promise as it applies to the founder of the city, Esau. If you remember the story, when Jacob left his home and went to his in-laws, upon his return approximately 21 years later, he was scared that Esau would still be indignant with him for usurping his birthright and his father's blessing. But instead, Esau had forgiven his brother and was so happy that his brother was coming home and was in good health. Esau was a blessing to Jacob, to Israel. And so perhaps at the end of days, God returns the favor and likewise blesses the descendants of Esau and keeps them out of the grasp of the beast. The woman is nourished. Where she is now caused to be nourished or fattened, for a time, times, and half a time from the presence, or literally the face, of the serpent. There is another passage in the Codex that seems to be speaking directly to this time of hiding, and it states that the rocks of the mountains will be their fortress. But it also talks about practical provision or nourishment for this woman, for the elect. Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. The sinners in Jerusalem shake with fear. Terror seizes the godless. Who can live with this devouring fire, they cry. Who can survive this all-consuming fire? Those who are honest and fair, who refuse to profit by fraud, who stay far away from bribes, who refuse to listen to those who plot murder, who shut their eyes to all enticement to do wrong. These are the ones who will dwell on high. The rocks of the mountains will be their fortress. Food will be supplied to them, and they will have water in abundance. God saves those who have a conscience and refuse to give themselves over to evil. They will be the ones, the elect, who dwell on high, perhaps the high cliffs of Petra. Literally, the rocks of the mountains will be their fortress, and she is now nourished, just as he promised. By the way, nourished is rendered in the present passive indicative. The woman is always, even now, nourished by God. This is evidenced by the fact that Israel has never perished despite the number of times she has been completely conquered, deported, nationalized, and so on, and let's not forget the many attempts at her extermination. Historically, this is a mere miracle. There is no people group in history who has ever survived this kind of treatment and retained their national and racial identity. For example, consider all the nations that once occupied the promised land as well as the other nations that were conquered by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, as well as the Medes and Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. None of those conquered people groups exist. They have been absorbed by the nations, assimilated, and every one of them lost their unique identity, much like those from the northern tribes of Israel who were assimilated into the nations. But that is not the case with the Jew. The survivors of the southern tribe of Judah and a remnant of others from the ten tribes? Why? Because God has always nurtured them. Thus they have always survived, even though the list of conquering nations goes on and on. Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greek, Rome, Arabs, Fatimids, Sedlujic, Turks, Crusaders, Egyptians, Marmelukes, Islamists, and others, including the British, the Germans, and the Soviet Union. But still, they survive and are amply nourished. Time times and half a times. Where she is now caused to be nourished, fattened, for time times and half a time. Given the timing of when Satan and the beast go to war against the two witnesses, and the centering event being the blowing of the seventh trumpet, we can be confident that this mystical three and a half year measurement of time times and half a time speaks of the final three and a half years of the tribulation. By the way, this is the only time this form of the mystical three and a half year measurement is used in Revelation. In fact, across the Codex, time times and half a time was used only two other times, and that was in the book of Daniel. Therefore, we should expect that contextually, these passages are aligned. First, Daniel is told that they presumably those belonging to the Holy One, are given into the hands of the horn that comes forth from the beast, speaking about the man we call the Antichrist, for times, times, and half a time. Second, Daniel is told that there will be a time of distress, such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. 
So the context of the passage is the day of the Lord, the time of Yahweh's wrath. He is then told about the rapture and how the dead will awaken to everlasting life. Then one angel asked another, how long until the end of these wonders? And the answer was time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years. Daniel is also told that from the time the abomination of desolation is established, there will be 1,290 days, which covers the entire span of the second three and a half year period, made up of literal 1,260 days, and 30 days of the first three and a half year period, for a total of 1,290 days. Thus, we can safely conclude that the elect of Israel will be protected and nourished during the last three and a half year period of the tribulation. The mystical three and a half years, the code. We've touched on this before, but now we get to the final variation of the mystical three and a half year period. What we have come to understand is that all the various renderings of the mystical three and a half year measurement are itself code. For example, we have learned that when the spirit speaks of 42 months, he is addressing the time allotted for the activity of the beast and the time of darkness. When he speaks of 1,260 days, he is addressing the time allocated to the people of God, both the two witnesses and the woman. And when he speaks of times, times, and half a time, he is addressing the elect of Israel, the one-third of the Jews that Yahweh takes through the fire, nourishes, and protects. If you follow the breadcrumbs long enough, the hints and the clues the Spirit leaves throughout the Codex, eventually the meaning of the code becomes clear. The face of the serpent. From the presence, literally the face of the serpent. This is an, a very important distinction. The woman is protected from the face, not the presence of the serpent. The face of the serpent is the terrifying part of the creature. The steely eyes, the tongue lashing in and out like a whip, the threatening fangs, the drips of poison seeping from the fangs, and the curled up and poised tense position as if ready to strike at any moment. Simply terrifying. The imagery associated with the face is a bit more potent than just the presence. Yahweh protects the elect from the face of pure, raw terror, the face of Satan. But that does not mean the elect are free from the tail. After all, Satan pursues her vigorously. Attack against the woman, Revelation 12, 15. And the serpent threw water like a flood out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. The water and the flood. The imagery in this verse is fascinating as the imagery associated with the enemy is switched once again from the dragon to the serpent. The serpent opens his mouth and water gushes forth out with torrential force, much like a flash flood, and tries to sweep the woman away with the flood. As we know, the image of the sea is code, which stands for the restless masses of humanity. In like manner, the water like a flood pouring forth from the serpent's mouth is also code. And this image represents a collection of peoples who have gathered at the bequest of Satan and the beast to destroy the woman, to sweep her away with the speed and ferocity of a flash flood. These people who come against this woman have been deceived, lied to, and they have now become an adversary that is ready and willing to attack and carry out the desires of the serpent and the beast. Their attack is quick, sudden, fierce, and forceful like the mighty torrents of a flash flood. This seems to be one quick attempt to wipe the woman off the face of the earth in the style of the Nazi blitzkriegs. We must keep in mind that this is a rendering of events that take place once the dragon is thrown down to the earth. And since the imagery switch from a dragon to a serpent, the focus is on Lucifer's cunning, manipulation, and deceit that causes people to turn their aggression, hatred, and anger, and wrath toward Israel. Now, whether this flood, this attack comes at the hands of the nations which surround Israel, or whether it's the great invasion of the nations led by Gog and Magog, we do not know and can only speculate. But we do know that this attack against this woman will come because of some serious deceit and manipulation by the serpent of the peoples of the earth, and it will come quickly. Much like the warning given about the abomination of desolation and it being a signal to flee, so is this flood, as once again Judah, not apostate Israel, 
is admonished to flee to the mountains. Luke 21, 20 through 24. But when you may see Jerusalem now caused to being surrounded by armies, then you are commanded to know that its desolation has come near. Then those who are in Judea, you are commanded to now flee to the mountains. And those who are inside the city, you are now commanded to depart. And those who are out in the country, you are commanded to now choose to not enter it. For these are days of vengeance to be caused to fulfill all that has been caused to being written. Alas, for women who are now being pregnant and for those who are now nursing infants in those days. For in the future, there will choose to be great distress upon the earth and wrath, ogre, against this people. They will in the future choose to fall by the edge of the sword and in the future be caused to be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will in the future choose to now trampling underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles might be caused to be fulfilled. The code in this passage is beyond fascinating. With the predominant use of the present tense and then the sudden jump to the future tense, this warning is peculiar and layered in terms of time. It seems clear that Jesus was warning the people of the coming devastation of their land, the days of vengeance, hence the frequent use of the present tense. It should be noted that this judgment in the days of vengeance all comes at the hand of Yahweh, though he utilizes the tool of the armies of the nations to bring it about. But then Jesus looked forward to the time in the future when there will be great distress upon the earth, as well as terrible wrath, indignation, hatred, and contempt for the Jews. And it will come like a flood. The woman is rescued, Revelation 12, 16. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon threw out of its mouth. Though the serpent is hoping to kill all the Jews in this flash flood-like attack, we know from the Codex that only two-thirds of the Jews will be killed, while one-third escape, for the earth will come to the aid of the woman. The earth opens its mouth and helped the woman. The earth or certain nations swallowed the flood of water that the serpent poured out from its mouth. In the same way that the large crevices around Petra quickly swallow up the water that periodically cascades upon the hardened desert surface, certain nations of the earth, perhaps Jordan, will rise to protect the elect and keep them from being overpowered by the flood. In this picture, we are seeing the armies of the enemies of Israel gathering to overrun her. After all, many nations have a stated goal regarding Israel, and that is to wipe Israel off the map. But certain nations who are still allies of Israel, and not yet under the control of the beast, step in and protect the woman. They literally absorb this attack and prevent this river from overrunning the elect. Again, maybe this is another role in which Jordan, and maybe the United Arab Emirates or other allies, will play in caring for Israel during the end times. The snake and the dragon. The passage begins with the image of the dragon, but then the imagery switches to the serpent as the serpent threw water like a flood out of his mouth. But then the imagery switches once again and addresses the flood which the dragon threw out of his mouth. So why the interposing of imagery? The snake symbolizes lies, deception, and manipulation. It is the activity of Satan as a snake that allows him to lie, to deceive and manipulate certain armies of nations to turn against Israel. What Satan did in the heavenlies, which is make accusations, he now implements on earth and his treachery is targeted at the woman. He will speak to the peoples, groups, and nations that are under the control of the beast and convince them through various accusations and anti-Semitic propaganda to go after the woman. We see that even today. For example, Nation after nation in our world speaks catastrophe against the nation of Israel, believing that she does not deserve to be a state. And even more terrifying, they state that the Jew does not deserve to live. And the strange thing is that these people really believe what they say. And that is because they have been overtaken by the myriad of lies which the serpent has for centuries spoken into their minds and hearts. An old Saudi king is quoted as saying, Our hatred for the Jews dates from God's condemnation of them for their persecution and rejection of Isa, Jesus, and their subsequent rejection of his chosen prophet, Muhammad. For a Muslim to kill a Jew or for him to be killed by a Jew ensures him an immediate entry into heaven 
and into the august presence of God Almighty. The Arab countries see to it that even young school children are taught to hate Jews. The Syrian minister of education wrote, The hatred which we indoctrinate into the minds of our children from their births is sacred. This is the act of the serpent. The dragon symbolizes power, strength, interposing intimidation, violence, fierceness, ferocity, and evil intent. Thus, while the snake lies and collects its followers, the dragon mobilizes the nations for violence against the woman. And though he uses seduction and deceit to manipulate those he turns against the woman, it is the dragon's hatred that will fuel the fires of aggression and brutality against the woman. Let's stop here and we'll pick up in our next podcast with the war against the two witnesses, a reprise of Revelation 11. I'm glad you tuned in and have been ready to listen. To get a free download of the full written transcript with all the scripture references footnoted, please go to threshermediagroup.com. That is T-H-R-E-S-H-E-R mediagroup.com. This is Steve with Thresher Media Group. When you're ready to listen, tune in.